John has been uh, dedicated his career to the innovation in live action cinema, VFX Post, and Lightfield Technology. As CEO of Lightfield Lab, he applies this expertise to the development of the next generation holographic technology. Carafin, having previously held executive roles at Lightro, Real ID, Digital Domain, holds multiple graduate degrees from Rochester Institute of Technology, as well as BFAs in multiple <coughs> fields from Ithaca College. And I, I think many of you may know John. He's been at many events here in Hollywood. I've met him several times at the VES events. And we're really delighted to have him here. And he's going to dazzle us with some amazing images. John. I can't top that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming out tonight and thank you for the entire tech team for the awesome projection making all this work and humoring my, uh, my swap out of the laptop here. But I'm going to show you a bunch of things tonight that are rather disruptive. I'm going to show you how to think about what do you do on the other side when you have all this wonderful volumetric content, these new emerging immersive technologies. How do you look at them? Are you going to be limited to the headsets? Are you going to be limited to stereoscopic things? I'm going to show you what we're doing and how to think about the difference between a true holographic projection versus the things that you might already be familiar with. So this will lead you through an analysis of the different types of things that you've seen, things that you might think of as holographic or as marketed as holographic and really tell you a bit more about the physics of how to think about what is a true hologram, what are the things that really distinguish it, and how do all the physics interact together. So with all that in mind, hoping that apparently we all have clicker problems tonight. There we go. Ah, it wasn't a button thing, it was a range thing. So a, a bit of a provocative thought that I always really like to start with. And what's really crazy today unlike any other decade in the history of mankind, is that we are spending more time looking at our displays and our devices than any other point in time in history. So you're actually looking at your display, just like you're all looking right now at this screen, more than you do anything else in your entire waking lifetime, yeah. which is crazy. Think about this. There has been no technology in the entire history of mankind that has that much significant impact than your visual display. And why is that? Well, that's how we have mass communication. That's how we talk, that's how we communicate. But we're still, at the end of the day, really painting on cave walls. That's still the way of the standard of what visual display is. And there are, every decade, these new emerging technologies for the past century, even over, over 150 years, where you see stereoscopic, you see AR, you see VR, you see these things that are trying to bridge the gap between the real and the synthetic, because we do have a deep psychological desire to visually communicate the exact same way that we interact in the real world. But that doesn't exist yet. Yet we're still spending more time, more than we're doing anything like sleeping and eating and in the Silicon Valley case, maybe sleeping is very low on the list, but that's a different problem. But more than we talk to people, we're looking at our phones, we're looking at these displays. So how do we resolve this? How do we think about this? And why is it that we have all these new emerging technologies that are out today? And what happens when you have a truly holographic future? So these are some visuals that we like to highlight and imagine when you're able to do a live broadcast and have the game in your living room. And of course, that's not limited to just that particular instance. You can do anything. Imagine being able to have tables that you can replace physical things. Imagine having digital counterparts, things that you can actually have a real world object and you can transport that anywhere else to anyone else's holographic display. Think about telepresence. This is one of the biggest challenges in, in, in business today is how do you have an international worldwide corporation and not have to have people physically go to another location? And video uh, communication really is very challenging. You don't have the line of sight. Imagine being able to look into a window that you can see the direct line of sight. You can look at somebody else right in the eye and it's as real as being right there, but they're somewhere else across the globe. Imagine, and this is appropriate for this theater, if, uh, and I'd point to somebody arbitrarily over here, 
Yes, sir. Imagine you're looking up, and you're actually being, <laughs> I woke him up, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you're actually able to see the underbelly of a 10,000 pound shark hovering right over you. And you can no longer tell the difference between the real and the synthetic. This is how we want to communicate. This is what you've seen in science fiction. This is the whole vision that everybody has promised us, but has been yet to be delivered. But this, everything we're showing here, I like to really make a big point, is exactly what the real physics can produce in a true holographic display. Now, you always have to maintain the true physics, the line of sight to the display, and I'll explain what that means. So now we're going to dive into the part, and hopefully I don't lose anybody here with actual physics, but this is usually the point in time where everybody's got the little butterflies in their belly going, eh, it sounds kind of like bullshit, right? How is it possible that we're going to have these real things, everybody's promised it, or the other half of you are saying, well, I thought Tupac was a hologram, right? And yeah. I'll talk about that in a second. But you should be highly skeptical. It's something I always encourage. Anybody who is telling you they have a holographic display, you should say, hmm, tell me more. I don't know if I believe that. So we encourage the skepticism for everybody except for me, of course, but you know, we're biased. Uh, no, but seriously, we, we do really want you to be armed as the creatives, as the technologists, as the producers in this industry to understand what is a real hologram, what is not, why is that important? Now this term, photography, is not something we made up. You can find it on Wikipedia, which makes it you know, real. Uh, <laughs> we'll go and change that tonight, don't worry. Uh, it's a term that refers to fake holograms. And it's something that has been coined for so many decades now because the term of the hologram originates back with the laser interference and coding of light and beautiful and awesome things. Obviously, they are stills and they're limited to more lab-oriented types of capture environments, but they're beautiful, and they really are reconstructing the exact physics of a real object. They're actually indistinguishable outside of you know, color and a whole bunch of other problems and clearly not digital. But why is that the inspiration? Why is that the thing that has been then referred to to be a hologram? So let's look at some of the physics here. I'm going to show you the world's worst magic trick now. And this is in reference to one of our big passions here, being Princess Leia. And of course, this is huge inspiration for all of us, but I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. For anyone who hasn't seen Star Wars, you should probably leave right now. No, uh, but the unfortunate reality is it's just visual effects, not really a hologram. So here's my awful magic trick. So I got a laser pointer, right? Real, you can see me pointing. And I'm going to transport light from here to here. There's nothing in between. Ta-da. Ah, see? Uh, yeah, thank you. All right. All right. You're hired. Okay. So the reason I'm showing this is I want you to ask yourself the question of why is it, it's going to sound like a dumb question, but it's really important, how is it possible that you don't see a big green line across my face? Because I am literally transporting something from here to over here and nothing in between. And the answer is because you cannot freeze a photon mid-air. And you will see images in the media, hence wonderful Princess Leia here, where it looks like you're stopping light midair. And you can't do that. Sorry, that's again, just visual effects. So when you see this here, and you see it looking like R2's got a big flashlight in his head, and you're projecting a kind of ghosty looking thing, and of course holograms will look much prettier than that, and it just stops. Well, I can't stop this laser pointer, right? You're gonna see me do this a lot because I get a lot of replay value and I'm going to give that guy a $5 bill. So it's something that we like to call the line of sight rule. So if you think about marketing images you see, particularly in the stereoscopic and the VR world, you'll see things that are breaking what's called the frame. And it's just stopping light midair. But if you use this eye line rule and you follow the line of sight from anyone looking at an object like this, what you're able to do is actually determine what would need to be in place to create the hologram? And in this case, if you had a holographic floor for everybody that is looking at this, except for R2, and he doesn't have eyes, so who cares? You would be able to project exactly that experience. I'm sorry, I think I offended some R2-D2 lover. Apologies. Uh, but when you have that, that would work for the two of them. It doesn't work for everybody at the perspective of this photograph because, again, you're breaking this frame. 
So this is the high level of the physics. It's a high level way of thinking about what is real, what is not. And we're going to kind of go through here, and I'll show you some visual examples. So by a show of hands, who has heard of the Tupac hologram? Who is asking what the heck is a Tupac? <laughs> All right, OK. And whoever didn't raise your hand, I don't know what the third option is, but there's one of these things. OK, so that's actually a technique known as Pepper's Ghost. It dates back over 150 years to the days of the carnival. Super cool. It's where the term smoke and mirrors comes from. But I show this to start. This is a little marketing type kiosk thing. And they use a little pyramids and sometimes it's just little corners. But if you've ever seen uh, one of those old detective movies and you see they've got the, uh, the two-way glass and only one person can see in and the other people can't see, well, that's all this is. It's a beam splitter. They have a 2D monitor up top and you're seeing the reflection of a 2D image, which looks cool because it's 2D and the 2D image look great. But it's really no different than if I was holding a mirror right here in front of me. Actually, I need to bring one better magic trick. And you just looked at the reflection of that display in the mirror. Ta-da, you've got a hologram. Not a hologram, just two-dimensional. So this is the easy way to think of what it is. And then when you see this in the media now, you'll see it on big stage shows. And apparently, everybody's a hologram. And Michael Jackson and Whitney Houston, and I don't know. The list goes on. One day, you'll see me here as a hologram, but a real one. But they look great in 2D because the 2D image looked great. So if you photograph something that was a 2D image with a 2D camera, well, it should look great because that's 2D. But you see these all over the place, and they're all marketed and called these holograms, and they're great for theme parks. And again, this is not a judgment of any technology. These are great. They have lasted a very long time, again, over 150 years. Try to find another display tech that has been 150 years out there. But it's not a hologram. That's the only thing we're trying to clarify is what you're actually looking at is 2D. Now, there's one exception to this rule if you're using a beam splitter in something like the Haunted Mansion. And they actually have real mannequins that are underneath where all the cars are going over. And you're seeing the dimension. Now, of course, it's 50-50, so you're seeing kind of ghostly looking things. But you do have actual volume and depth. But it's not actually a digital display. But again, super cool technique. All right, so let's go and talk about some of the other things that you may have seen or heard of. One of my other favorite topics is volumetric display. Now, this is going to look a little like it's violating my little magic trick here. Um, now, this is uh, a technique that it looks like you have these little floating points of light, but it's actually creating, rather than just a ray of light, a miniature particle explosion. So if you were to reach out and touch that, you will literally die. So not really child-friendly, not something you want to bring in the home. I think some of you aren't stunned nearly enough, and maybe you want one of these. But it's really cool, uh, except it's, uh, you, it, it'll kill you. So it's more military-grade type of weaponry. Uh, but what they're doing here, again, is you create that little particle explosion. Instead of my hand here, I create something that is a particle. It explodes. You have light on it, and sequentially you kind of roll through, and you see little dot matrix lines. Again, very cool tech. You have another version of a volumetric display, and the definition of volumetric display, think of it like a point that is the same point in all directions, same color, same intensity, no reflection, no refraction, no physics, but it is a 2D point you can place in volume, in depth. So this is a variant of that, which is really defining how you're able to see kind of the wireframe. You always see the front, you see the back at all points in time. I put it in the category I call the vibrator display category. And what they're doing is they take a 2D type of a display and they literally will shake it and vibrate it really fast. And they bolt that table down so it doesn't literally hop right off and flip over. But it creates something that's really cool. As you walk all the way around, you see that wireframe. But you don't get the true physics, all the things that Ryan was talking about, that Aryan was talking about for the 4D functions, the 5D functions, the true physics of how you see real things but you do have a real object, a real point that you're able to see, albeit a 2D point in space. There's other variants that are less uh, vibrate where you'll create these 2D slices and they roll through it uh, sequentially like a piece of smart glass and then they project really quickly and that's why you see all the little striations that are on the sides. But again, you're creating that 2D volumetric display tech. Looks great. Um, but again, you're not creating anything that's holographic, and that's why you're actually seeing both the front and the back at all points in time. Now, other things that you might have seen, and if anybody's been to any conference in the past three years or so, you see the wonderful world of spinny things. And uh, they're at Infocom, at CES, anywhere. Now, this is another uh, trek into the world of danger displays. 
where what it is is a fan blade with an LED diode and through something that's moving faster than the persistence of vision, it creates a 2D image on a fan. Now, it's ironic that they create little kid things like this and a hamburger because you want to reach out and grab it, but you'll lose your fingers. So you won't die like the death laser, but you might bleed to death. So these are cool, but when you see it, again, a 2D image of it, they render it, it makes it look like it's rotating and moving around, which is cool, but it's two-dimensional and it has no actual holographic nature to it. All right, so one of the other categories that we like to highlight because they are super cool, you actually have seen them, and if you haven't gone out and seen what Looking Glass is doing, I highly advocate for it. Now, this is a technique called lenticular or autostereoscopic or multi-view, which is great. It's similar to thinking of what you would see in a stereoscopic movie theater when you put glasses on or VR and AR, and you've got your stereoscopic display, but no glasses. So what they're doing is creating a spray of light in one dimension. And that gives you parallax. That gives you some motion parallax. That allows you to have something that you'll see depth in a volume. It's a very, very good approach. What you'll actually see is an object, but you do not get a point of light. You don't get something that your eye will naturally focus on because your eyes are circular, not a big slit. So that's just showing one of those cool techniques. You also have other things. Uh, the next video here, assuming my little clicker goes, yep, is of Microsoft. Now they're doing something that is using head tracking, so it's more of a, a, a one viewer experience. And there's a bunch of other companies that are doing this as well. So think of this as a directional backlight. You've only got two views at any one point in time. It tracks your eyes as you move around. You'll get both full resolution images, meaning left and right eye are both full res or half res, depending on what tech you're using. And it will make sure that you're getting great res and it tracks. But that's what you're seeing here as it kind of jumps between the different uh, viewpoints as somebody's moving. So latency, a whole bunch of other problems, but it is another technique to get something that is glasses free. Over here, this is in the category called super multi-view. Uh, what they're doing and what you don't see here is behind you, so think of the back of the theater, there are called about 100 massive projectors. And each one of them represents one of the integral images from an auto stereo uh, image set. And you project onto this diffractive screen or a holographic diffuser, and you get, again, stereoscopic. So as you move around, it's super multi-view, <laughs> meaning much higher density, much higher spatial and uh, UV or perspective resolution, but you're not getting an actual verging point. But again, super good tech. The other one that you may see, and you'll see a whole bunch of companies, this one here happens to be Samsung. Uh, you probably <coughs> saw the world's first holographic phone with red, not actually hologram. Uh, a bunch of other technologies, Amazon had these, the 3DS, again, another auto stereotype display. And what you're seeing here as they move between the different views is once it goes pseudoscopic, it jumps between different views. But you're seeing, in this case, diagonally, the lenticular, meaning it's a cylindrical kind of a lens, a bunch of different optical techniques to do it, and you're getting left eye and you get right eye. But again, not an actual real verging object. So that's kind of showing you a bit of the landscape in the display space, and I always like to highlight this one, and let's not forget VR and AR. Um, now this is real. <laughs> this is something that I can't make up, and I will challenge you to please help me understand why is there a display in front of her? <laughs> Any, no, I got nothing. I, I don't know. I, I, for the life of me, I just can't figure out why that's uh, required. But uh, you two can turn a porta potty upside down, put it on your head, um, but this at one point was state of the art. And it's, again, VR, AR is great. It's, it's something for a single viewer experience. You're able to see objects that are projected, but it is still stereoscopic. You're just re-rendering so that you can take the light field content, re-render it based upon where your head is moving, but you're not actually verging or focusing on a real point. Let me talk about why that is really important. It's important because the way you see the real world, the way that we visually communicate has nothing to do with the object. It's because photons are everywhere. So in this case, if I have this bird or this flower or literally anything, you can't freeze that photon midair. What is happening is the photon will strike and interact with that surface and ultimately reflect, refract, diffract, project, or otherwise create a bundle of rays that will reach your eye. Now, these are going in all directions, as Ryan was showing. And the reason that this is really key and critical and important is because you're actually seeing a verging point, 
that your eye will focus on. And that's why the entire real world is actually all in focus until your eye selectively verges, accommodates, and you see something that has now depth of field. That's how camera lenses work. That's how your eye works. So let's tie this now to the way to think of what a true holographic display is doing, where you have this as your model. If you now imagine you have a flat panel or curve, doesn't matter what the surface is, but it's projecting the four-dimensional collimated beams of light. And it will then verge into what's known in the optics world as a real image or virtual if it's inside the display. And from that position forward, it is in fact identical to the real object. And that's the highest level way to think of it. There's a whole bunch of nuanced physics that I'll, I'll even scratch the surface on with my remaining minutes here before I get pulled off stage. Okay, so this is the way to think about what you need to do. It's what we call the inverse and opposite reflection of light. That is what we're converging into a cone. Think of everything as a very dense cone of these collimated beams. They will then be focused at a very, very small spot. And that is how all optics, including your eyes, including cameras, how it works. Now it's in reverse. So take everything that Ryan said and say it backwards. That's what this is doing. OK, it's that easy, done. All right, so with that said, let's do again, and this is for uh, the techno geeks in here, uh, rather than showing kind of pretty things in rendered birds. I'm going to show you how to think about these new concepts. So there's a new term here that you should think of. We like to map it to the things that you would do in the 2D world. So you now have a holographic pixel. Simple, right? What does that do? Well, this is now, in our case, it's a holographic waveguide. It is creating a spray of light from otherwise holographic subpixels. And there's a lot of different ways, and you can create interference, and you can do other things. But if you just think of these as those 4D points in a planoptic function, not to get too technical, and for Technical purposes here, I'd like to make some caveats. Uh, this is an illustration, so each one of these holographic pixels, not the size of your head. I was once quoted as that. Please don't quote me as that. And the other one is much higher density, any color, blah, blah, blah. Keynote will crash if I go any higher than this. So what these will then interact and what they will do is act to create a directional spray of light. And these are going, obviously, in both dimensions. So I'm showing just 1D here, but you'll see a virgin cone. And if I modulate these signals to converge at this cone, and not just three rays, you'll have millions of these rays that are converging to that spot, you will see it as a real object. So that would be the bird's wing. That would be whatever real object you want to create in space. So this then forms a cone of light. And that cone is defined by partially the size of your overall display surface, again, that eye line rule, as well as what is the angular component of each of these holographic pixels. So as long as you stay within, we'll call it the holographic safe zone, every single person, no head tracking, no object tracking, nothing else, you will see the real object projected in space as if it was truly there. And if you move backwards, you move forwards, it doesn't matter. It is a dense converging wavefront that is as real as having the real thing. The next most important parameter is how far you're going to project off or inside of the surface, and that is a function of how many photons or how many rays of light do you have. And if you take that to the next level and you think about why does this all matter, how does this actually all function, if you create something like this or something much more creative, as you'll hear about, what the display is actually doing is creating these converging wavefronts, these converging bundles, and each time you form those cones, because it is a collimated function, you're actually seeing the real thing. So this is, again, high level, and if I haven't lost half of you, I'll be very happy. Uh, but this, from the way to think of it creatively, is now, what are the parameters? So this is what we like to call the creative knobs. The three main things to understand, just like any other display, is what is the required field of view? What is your projection distance, meaning how far off, how far in? And visual acuity, we're always asked what's the 2D equivalent resolution. It's kind of irrelevant with holograms. What it really turns into is just like going to the DMV and getting your vision test. I know, really boring talking about holograms. But how close can you get to the display, to the object, and maintain sharp visual resolution? And that's the three things you need to calculate. And with density and dollars, you can do literally anything. So. <laughs> It's kind of like if you wanted a 16K display today, you want to have some ridiculous resolution, well, you can do that. You just need to figure out the manufacturing process for it. Same thing with holograms. If you say, like many of our first alpha customers, they go, well, we need everything. And I go, great, that's a billion dollars. And they go, eh. well, 
I'll be happy if you have a billion dollars. We'll do that, no problem. Uh, but it turns into the same thing with a display of even this size in 2D. Well, how close are you really going to stand? If I'm all the way up here, I can see all the pixels. But back there, it's the appropriate resolution because you'd be crazy to watch a movie that close. So again, that's kind of the way to think of it. But now you've got this next compounding problem of, well, that's a ridiculous amount of resolution. So, oop, shouldn't be jumping yet. Oh, spoiler. Oh, 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 sad. Okay, hey, it's back. Okay. So display resolution historically, and again, this is kind of hand wavy and average, about every 10 years you get a bit of a quadruple. So think of standard def going to 2K, 4K, 8K, and quadruple because by area, of course, right? So let's argue that in the 2020s, 8K will become a thing with mass production that can happen. All right, we'll fast forward and say 2030s. I might be dead by then, but you know, uh, maybe 16K. Now, to get something that is truly holographic and something that will project to allow your eye to focus mid-air, let's see where we're really at. And you already saw the spoilers, so of course now it's not going. There it goes. Thank you, now we got it again. All right, so that's today. So to do something that's actually creating true holographic projection of ray density, you need to have many, many gigapixels, hundreds of gigapixels, which if you haven't heard that term, good because if you had that display, it'd save me a lot of time. But if nothing else changed and you went with the natural progression of silicon development, at best, you're end of century to get to those types of true resolution. That's just kind of scratching the surface, not even talking about the holodeck or what I've been now told by uh, the millennial generation is the danger room. I've learned something new. I'm sad that I didn't uh, call it that before. Okay. So how do we resolve all that? What are we doing? So I'm going to give you a quick high level here, and I'm totally out of time, but I want to show you what we're doing because this is usually the point where I've totally exhausted you with all the things that are not holographic. Let's talk about what we're doing. So we have a technology. You can see this in the lab. I'll show you a little glimpse of a video so you don't have to say it's all bullshit. Uh, it already runs by order of magnitude even though it is a single tile. At it's actually less than six by four inches. It already drives the photon projection at 16,000 by 10,000 pixels. So 160 million rays for each one of these tiles. Now, our model, what we're doing is not building small things. This is a tile just like a video wall where you take one of those, you put it into a larger, call it an 18 inch panel, and from that panel, you go into a big wall. So if you understand the physics, which you're all now all trained experts, of holographic display technology, as you go to larger surfaces, without doing anything different with the same projected density, you actually will project further and you have a much wider cone of light. So the bigger the surface has a big impact on what you do. So the reason that this is important and significant, you can see this running in the lab today. Please schedule well in advance. That's all I have to ask. Jeff is gonna kill me, he's here. Sorry, Mark, sorry, Jeff. All right, so what you're gonna see is a, you know, several inch holographic projection because it's a tiny little tile. Think of it again, based upon the size and surface area. But from here, it's the exact same thing. You take that tile, you then build it up into a full panel. And that's just the same way that you would build any other video. Well, they create little panels, they have these little PCBs, and now you've gone from your little tiny seahorse into a big fish scene. So you're over a foot of holographic projection without doing anything at all different. Now, this is still not what the product is. The product is building an entire wall. And that, if you imagine being this sized cinema screen, will allow you with the exact same thing that's in the lab right now, you can project out tens of feet of true holographic volume. Now the impact of this is where when you can no longer discern the difference between the real and the synthetic, you have completely transcended the idea of the display. You have replaced physical things and physical objects. So now this is officially the point where people go, bullshit, right? Yeah, see, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna show something that is not the display, but I'm gonna show something that's even better. Uh, because we're always asked, can you take a photo? Can you take videos and answers? Yeah, it looks great, photographs perfectly, but it's a 2D screen and I don't, as a habit, bring prototypes around because you know it's a lot of travel, a lot of flight cases. But what you're gonna see, we, held, we hosted a little uh, marketing event where, I won't even call it marketing, we hosted some of our trusted uh, industry experts, some investors, uh, some customers, at least anyone who would sign the release form to let me show it. And I would request, please don't video this. Um, but I want you to see their reaction seeing the display for the very first time. And you're hearing it from the industry, many of the people that are here today, some that are not, but 
Instead of hearing it from me, because clearly I'm biased, I want you to hear what other people are saying, and this is all real-world information. So the reason that we really like to show that is because what you're seeing people do in that video is we give them little props and little things and cups, and one of the main things is magnifying glasses and an actual piece of diffusion glass. So just think about a piece of roughened glass. And the reason for that is you actually will focus directly through it the exact same way your eye focuses midair. If you use a magnifying glass, you'll actually see the object magnify or minify the real way that a real object would. So those are the types of things that we do for the, uh, the, the geeks in the inner of all of us when you really want to see how that is very different than other display technologies out there. So I've gone way over my time, and I do apologize. But in summary, I really, really look forward to working with each and every one of you. That is the importance of the standards body. It's the importance of SMPTE. Everything that we do is an entire industry, and we have to do that together. So thank you for your time.